using the technology based on the integration of the Playboy and I see one must recover from using printing markups on the patch as we get more set on. Yeah, it's good for the panel. <laughs> Live already. <laughs> we're live. No, we're live. We're live already. We are we are live and recording this, so uh, we all can sit down so we can start and that was really great. Yeah, please, please sit down and it's cooler up here. We try to start on time because these days we actually do a YouTube stream and it'll be up on YouTube. So if, if, we, if we become incoherent and you want to re-listen to it, you'll get the chance. Hi. How many of you have not been to a night day event before? See, this this really makes me happy. A bunch of us payment geeks. Night day started in 2006. It kind of got revitalized in 2010. We be we became a nonprofit incorporated in 2011. And our notion was that there's a space in this world that's changing rapidly, the transaction world, for events like this where it's interactive conversations, kind of hoping to replicate those great knocks of people that you bump into when you're milling around money 2020 and you talk for 10 minutes with some really smart people. So we try to do that. And you know, it's all volunteer, so it took a while to get there. But it's really coming together. And this event has really amazed me. I, uh, I, it's, it's doing really well. So. Um, one of the rules and one of the things at Night Pay is you should always be ready to ask a question. This is not just folks on the panel talking and then you guys you know, go and drink and leave, but it's interactive. Uh, we had a very good one six months after EMV rolled out with a guy who was on the EMV transition forum, migration forum, and a grocer who wasn't happy, and it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were there, that was up. Anyway, um, we, I think we'll have a lot to talk about, so I don't want to babble too long. First of all, uh, David Drew, President of IPEC, I want to thank very, very much uh, to our sponsor. We've got an event sponsor, and we've got a year-long sponsor. And first will be Vandiv, and uh, who's going to say hi for Vandiv? I will. Hey, Alex. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. I told David that if you gave us the event, we would sell out the room, so you can all get your checks for $10 on the way. <laughs> um, and, and today is actually history, so you, you can see the Vandiv logo, you can call it, well, you can like call us Vandiv, for a couple more hours. But in reality, today, the New York Stock Exchange, uh, Van of WorldPay, you know, rang the opening bell, the closing bell. And, uh, you know, Van of, which was the largest acquirer uh, in the U.S., is now the largest acquirer in the world. We wow. acquired and merged with WorldPay. We now cover 99% of the world. So uh, we figure out which country we don't cover. So uh, <laughs> welcome, and we're excited to talk to you about payment facilitation and what's going on. So thanks, Van. And then thanks also to DWD, David Wright Tremaine, they have been incredibly good friends and support us, provided space, and this year they're sponsoring us. They know payments like nobody's business, and Claude, you want to say? Well, thanks. Uh, I'm Claude Gertz. I run Davis Wright Tremaine's financial services practice, and I want to actually reciprocate thanks to you, David, for putting, I think, the best content uh, in the payments industry out there month after month. So the opportunity uh, to sponsor NIPE was a no-brainer for us. 
that's not our standard for success. But <laughs> that we have to be a part of this um, uh, because payments is such an important part of what we do. So, yeah, so uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this was such a hot topic. We had two reporters here. So uh, can you sort of say who you are so people know how to whisper when they're around you? <laughs> okay, so we got a couple of people. I don't know if maybe only one showed up, so there we go. Yeah, but, I, I major with Merging Market. I write about FinTech specifically. I uh, look forward to the panel. Yeah, so, and uh, I do that because once years ago, we got in trouble because the guy for, for a PE firm was a little too free about a one of their portfolio firms they wanted to unload. And <laughs> so, but I, beyond that, the whole point of this is to have a really open discussion. We've got a. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, so, uh, let me do a quick. Uh, we've got a wonderful, wonderful panel here. So, we've got Todd, Todd Applewitz, and we've got, wait a minute, we've got Kevin Harris. Thank you, Harris. We've got, we've got Joe Papalardo and uh, Jake West. West. Okay, Jake West. And I'll let, rather than fumbling an introduction about who they are, let me each walk through and talk a bit about who they are and what they do. All right. I, was, uh, I always get the alphabetical call. Uh, Todd Ablowitz, I've been in payments 20 years, 10 years at First Data, uh, three years at uh, a startup, some of you I've seen know, called Vivotech. We made a lot of the stuff that you know, helped over time. Mike, put the mic on. They didn't give me instructions. Just a bus. All right, so uh, uh, I'll start over, sorry. 20, uh, 20 years in payments, 10 years at First Data. I uh, started in 96 uh, in diapers. Uh, and uh, three years at a, at a uh, little startup called VivoTech. I uh, got enamored with the mobile payments stuff. I was talking with Mark earlier about mobile payments, and it was really exciting in the early days, but a difficult place to consult. And Visa, MasterCard, American Express all started changing the rules, discovered, started changing the rules in, uh, for merchant acquiring in about 2011. Uh, right about the same time that Square was gaining traction, Stripe was at the time called DevPay, and uh, saw a lot of opportunity, <coughs> helped some of those companies, uh, DevPay being one of them, uh, get going as a payment facilitator, we helped uh, Shopify launch their Shopify payments. I think they had half a million merchants now. Uh, so we, we just got really early, and then it got a lot bigger than we expected. Uh, and we have helped more than 150 companies in the payment facilitator space uh, for six or so years. We also started a software company called Infinicept, and we're a payment facilitator. It's basically software for a payment facilitator in a box, so you can get launched in a week instead of a year. Um, and then we uh, we launched PaymentFacilitator.com a few years ago. And that's a new site, free new site. If Todd had so many titles, I couldn't fit them on the screen. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm Kevin Harris. I am the Chief Finance and Operating Officer for Run Sign Up. Run Sign Up is the leading uh, race event online registration provider in the U.S. Uh, this past year, we hosted about fifteen thousand races on our site. And we had about 4.2 million people <coughs> sign up for one or more uh, races with us. We processed about $170 million worth of credit card transactions. And uh, we are a registered payment facilitator. Uh, that's why they had me here on the panel today. <laughs> and um, use case. Exactly, exactly, use case. And, um, and that's, uh, that's it. That's my history. So hit the green button. Are we ready? Yeah, we're uh, I'm Joe Papalardo. Uh, I'm from Aqualine uh, Financial Services. We're a financial technology focused private equity firm here out of New York. Um, I spend all of my time uh, in payments. I had our payments practice. Um, we have uh, a couple investments in the space. Uh, one called Together Work, which uh, really utilizes this model. Uh, I guess on the private equity use case here, um, no loading businesses for us who are very friendly. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, basically what the other work is, is um, a consolidation platform for software businesses that, um, you know, really outwardly are not payments businesses, you know, they're, they're, they're all in the group management software space, they help things like fraternities, you know, fraternity software business, you know, fraternities, uh, summer camps, um, you know, sports leagues, um, sort of they run themselves and administer, administer themselves. Um, just so happens that they all subsist off of collecting payments from you know, connecting member dues or sort of registration fees from their 
from their um, from their end customers. And, um, and as a platform, we help them do that through the payback model. And um, and really, just probably are seeing this sort of you know this, this adoption of software and, and, and payments um, you know more broadly in lots of verticals, anywhere from you know plumbing and dance studios to to just broader billing businesses. So. Um, very excited to talk more about the topic tonight. I think it's very timely and very early innings, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. Okay, cool. Hi, my name is Jake West. I'm uh, based in Durango, Colorado, the uh, payments mecca of the world. Um, and, yeah, Durango, yes. Durango Jake is my Twitter handle. Um, I, I, I kind of fell into payments. I went to school in Durango, Colorado, and there was a small company called Mercury Payments that was uh, just forming in, in 2006 when I joined. We focused on building partnerships with point of sale software developers and embedding our payments within their platform. Uh, we grew that business and were acquired by Bantam in 2014. Um, I now lead business development, new partnerships with software developers in the payback line of business. And uh, as Alex mentioned, we are now WorldPay as of today. So I've officially, uh, now I've been part of three companies without ever changing my job. So I'm uh, very happy to be here, and thanks for inviting us. So I thought the first thing I'd do is, how many of you have the acquirer space nailed and you know it all, and how many of you would like to kind of break the ice a little bit? Is everyone like totally cold with acquiring, or? I guess no, right? Okay. So I put together, and this was a guess on my part, a couple of uh, acronyms to make it use. One thing I try to do here is if you use an acronym without explaining it, you get penalized. However, that's not always possible in a good discussion. So there's three or so that are probably get used a lot tonight that are ISB, an independent software <coughs> vendor. And I think it was a combination of Wikipedia or something I got this from. Organizations specializing in making and selling software designed for maps and niche markets. A, a value-added reseller. We'll probably say bar tonight here, won't we, at some point? And a bar is a company that adds features or services to an existing product and then resells it. And then uh, ISO, as you may all know, which is sort of the feed on the street organization to go knock on the merchant's door and say, hi, I can save you 20 basis points, come with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. So, yeah. sorry guys, okay. So those are some of the acronyms that are probably get mentioned. If other ones come up that you're not sure of, just kind of raise your eyebrows and I'll kind of interrupt. You can grab this later if anyone wants the, the definition. But I thought I'd first start off, since it's payment facilitator. Uh, you know, what, Jake, why don't you just start off and give us your description of what it would be, so we kind of start off a level set. We all can chime in to yeah. add to it. Sure. So, payment facilitators to Vantive today are are really ISV. So we focus on um, vertically focused software companies that develop a proprietary software for a specific vertical, typically, or sometimes payment companies that have a proprietary technology or gateway platform. And we help turn those ISVs into mini bands, into payment companies. So we provide ISVs with the tools to instantly board, uh, to fund, and report to their sub -merchants. So instead of having a handoff process where the ISV is selling their software, and then trying to introduce a, a third-party payment processor to then negotiate rates and fees, that ISV offers a more complete solution. So they're offering, of course, their software, and they're also a mini payments company. So it's, a, <coughs> in our world, a true white-label experience where the sub-merchant has no idea that Vanit is the back-end processor. So, I'm sure Todd, you probably have anything to add to that? Just to so, uh, uh, so, I would I would add to what Jake said. If you just take sort of the definition of a payment facilitator, okay. this is not a vague, some, someone who moves money around. It's a named, defined term at Visa and at MasterCard, and I believe American Express calls it a payment service provider, as does Discover. Um, no, you're, right you're aggregator. Payment, payment aggregator. Payment aggregator. So we, you're going to hear terms in the payment facilitator space like PSP, a payment service provider, payment facilitator, or PF, payment aggregator, aggregator, merchant aggregator, um, <coughs> merchant of record. Other than merchant of record, those all mean the same. Mer Yes. I'm yes. just curious, is the PSP, is it equivalent to, because that's often used in Europe, they use that term, even in the EU, the regs, it's the same thing? Most times when people talk about payment service provider, they mean the same thing, but in 
Europe, it gets very confusing because there are um, legal terms and there are payment institutions and it gets much, much more complicated, which is why a lot of the brands have moved away from calling it payment service provider. But if you're talking in the U.S. payment market, you'll see a lot of the processors are still calling it PSP or payment service provider and they're meaning payments or payment. Any other add-ons to that? Um, just that uh, it, there may be two or three things if it's okay. Um, one is, <laughs> it used to be that you'd have a bank and maybe a processor. You might have an ISO that you'll see on your chart here, and the ISO would do sales, and then there'd be a merchant. And when Square, really Square was one of the big innovators in this. There were some others in, in the past generation, uh, like PayPal. But what they did is they said, Look, all the technology between the processor and the merchant is really hard to change. It's not very flexible. We want to take over boarding, funding, uh, uh, reporting. And so they had to look at merchant. And then they had their customers, who were the individual locations and small businesses, their customers were called sub merchants. And they were doing that outside the rules for a long time. And then when the rules were changed in 2011, that got formalized to payment facilitator and sub merchants. Was it both Square and PayPal that were going outside the rules, or was it who kind of pushed Square it? Square was the one. I think Square really pushed it. Uh, Stripe was later, but quite aggressive on it as well. And it probably from 09 to middle of 11 was about the time that it was um, a little bit of wild west. And, and when, they, when these companies do that, either they're going to get shut down, which Square did for a while, or they're going to get the rules. Was, was Square turned off for a while? Square, Chase turned off Square for a few months uh, because of fraud and, and uh, uh, compliance. At least that was the outside story. And uh, but they kept they turned them back on once they got their their systems set. So so the thing to think about with it is in the traditional model, you had the processor and then some sales arm that went out and talked to the merchant. You would say, hey, Mr. Merchant, would you like to process with me and sign the agreement? And then there would be an underwriting process, and that individual merchant would sign a contract, ultimately with the acquiring bank. And it could be a lengthy process. It could take a couple of weeks. When I worked at First Data, it was not pleasant. Five pages, 200 questions. Things like that. So <laughs> it could be onerous to, to become a merchant or to switch your processing. And of course, the sales guys want to make it as easy as possible, but there was an individual underwriting and responsibility. What the payment facilitator model did is it said, hi, you're a master merchant, and keep me straight here, you take on the responsibility of that. Right. So, so talk me through that a little bit, just the, the yeah, kind of so process. During our underwriting process, we're underwriting that HVAC, that ISV, based on how they would then underwrite their submergents. Um, so instead of underwriting each individual submergent going through a lengthy application process, we instead look at the software company, uh, their stability, their policies and procedures, which companies like Double Diamond help create and implement. And then instead of having to underwrite each one of our sub merchants, we're underwriting that software developer up front. We then have a API uh, where that software provider basically puts in the W9 information of a merchant, their legal name, federal tax ID number, et cetera. And then we will instantly issue a merchant ID, or within eight, eight seconds, we'll issue a merchant ID to uh, to that software provider. So, if I'm signing up, or if I'm signing up for a race, instead of having to tell that race organizer, go talk to Vanna, then they'll negotiate your rates, and hopefully you get through underwriting because your race is next week. Um, instead, they could say, "Hey, as you're purchasing our software, let's start running transactions at the same time." So you, as Vanna, as the actual acquirer slash processor, you would then look at the pay pack and it's kind of looking at the management of a company you want to invest in and say, these guys are solid, you know, I will invest this much with them. <laughs> and then it's the responsibility of the pay pack to make to look over their merchants, to make sure the yeah. merchants are good. And, yeah, and, and, and uh, they're on the hook, I guess, for a certain amount of that to set a contract and think about the liability. Right. So, so you know, yeah, 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 let me let me take it through how, how all that works. Let me take you through how all that works for us. So Run Sign Up is a ISV, we're an independent software vendor. And we really fit the definition that was up there. We really consider ourselves to be a software company. Our objective is to provide the best <coughs> registration software possible for a race. We help them uh, set up the race, we give them a free website, we help them with their marketing, we allow them to send out free emails, uh, to, to do email marketing, uh, we allow them to text the participants with results. So our business is really about creating really good race registration software. 
But these folks that come and set up with us, they want to get paid. And they want to get paid on a regular basis, and they want to know that we're stable and that we have a good process for doing all that. So when someone comes on uh, with a new race event with us, uh, we are primarily a self-serve site. Uh, we have larger clients that we help get them set up, but we're primarily a self-serve site. So people come on and they fill out a seven-step wizard on our site, and that wizard asks them, when's your race going to be held? How much is it going to cost? Do you get a free t-shirt? Where is it going to be held? All the information about the race, who your sponsors are, do you have a charity that you're raising money for? And at the end of that process, we ask them information to help them set up a payment account. And that's the same kind of stuff that Banta or, or any other um, acquirer would be looking for. That's um, who's the entity that's going to get paid, what's their address, what's their phone number, who's the principal of that entity, what's all the information that goes along with that. So we're doing all of that underwriting by way of our software that Vandiv or, or any other company like them would do. And at the end of that process, they get a website. And it's live, and they can take uh, registrations with credit card um, that, we help, that we've helped them uh, by way of our software put up and get going. And in the background, uh, we do the underwriting on that account. We have a payment account review queue. Uh, we have about 20 new payment accounts that come in a day. And we have a full-time underwriter that goes through that information the same way the risk and, and underwriting folks would advance it. Uh, we do that on the front end. And um, uh, once they've been approved, then they um, can get paid from us. Um, we actually allow transactions to process before that. Um, but uh, that's basically how it works from, uh, from the process of an ISV or an independent <coughs> And having looked at hundreds of these companies and helped them uh, run sign-up, it's a perfect example. We talk about them all the time. Uh, the reason that this model is so much better, in my view, than the traditional model is as good as Vantage will ever be at underwriting a merchant and looking at all the data and looking at their website, they can never know even half of what Run Sign Up knows about their customers. They're in the race industry. They know what a fake race is going to look like. They, and they, you find them from time to time. They know what a fake race is going to look like. They know what the criteria are for a good race. Their customers trust them. They pay them far more than they would pay just to a generic payment system. Question in the back. Question for Kevin. Do you tend to work with one processor or several? We actually work with two processors. Um, Vantiv is our preferred processor. Uh, we became a registered payment facilitator about three years ago with Vantiv. Uh, prior to that, we worked with Braintree. We worked both with their marketplace product and with our own merchant account. Uh, we don't like to do business on our own merchant account, and we've been de-emphasizing that model over the last three years. It's down to a very small percent of our business. Uh, Braintree's marketplace product, um, I would call them payment facilitator-like. Um, they have some um, deficiencies that, that uh, we think Vanda does a better job with. And, um, uh, and so we've, we've been moving more and more of our business there over time, uh, but we do still have the two processing relationships. We're about 70% with Vanda and about 30% with Vantage. I got a geek question about this. So if, if, if you're traditionally acquired, and, and maybe this is for Jake, I mean, you then will know all the individual merchant IDs or MIDs. I mean, we got to do acronyms, so merchant ID. So if someone's running through a payment facilitator, do you, do you know or care what the MIDs are or not? Yeah, we actually provide a specific MID under our, the master MID to each race that signs up. So okay. it's much clearer from a you know funding perspective as well as the description on a, on a you know consumer statement. If I'm signing up for a race, I want to see the you know the uh, the race you know the race that I signed up for and the charge associated with it when you have a traditional mid you're able to put in 21 characters and uh, numbers associated with that merchant ID 21 or 24 24 24 thank you three for the for the feedback uh, R U N star and then Jake's race 800 then just from a consumer perspective that's when you get think of the times when you received a statement that you look at on your on your statement and you're like what the hell was that and that constraint I believe is a network constraint or what's the constraint the 24 character constraint where does that come from it's a some system network. constraint well it has to show up on the customer statement right so there's it's, it's standardized if you go above that it won't, it won't make it to the customer which statement. is why there is a, a particular art uh, I mean I'll just say in fitting in enough information in that very small space 
so that the customer, when seeing the charge on their card, does not say, I wasn't there. And at least one of the card brands dictates where you can put the asterisk. Um, you have to put it in the third, the eighth, or the thirteenth <coughs> position, I believe. The fourth, eighth, thirteenth. <laughs> so, I mean, is that the case that mid case? Is that the case across the whole industry, or is that the way that Vandip does it, or other people do it a different way? Yeah, sorry, I can't speak for everyone. It's the way that Vandip does it. Um, other. Well, I'm sure everyone else does. Yeah, uh, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the descriptor is shorter with the other processor that we have, which is actually one of the. I just I just happened to sign up for a race today. <clears throat> I apparently not because I got an email back from I am I am athlete, and it, it gives all the details. But it says your credit card bill will read I am athlete LLC. So it's not going to give the name of the race. Uh, if there's any uh, compliance people in the room, you might want to give them a call. <laughs> 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 okay, so, so, so what's the, because we're payment geeks, what's the compliance issue there? Because it's not identifying fully who the merchant is? All the card brands require, most of the card brands require that you put the name of PF uh, in the first position. Payment facilitator. And payment facilitator, Thank you. then you put an asterisk, or uh, some brands require the asterisk, some don't, and then you have to have the name of the sub merchant because you don't know what race you signed up for. Some people will forget, but, you know, and, and that, that I know that's is a problem. Yeah. Um, when you're it, it sounds like that's probably a merchant of record model, um, and that's kind of the you know when you think about what's the difference between a merchant of record or a payment facilitator, um, we think about payment facilitators as a one-to-many solution, right? So you are a uh, a software provider, but as a consumer, when I'm signing up for a race, I don't know if it's, you know necessarily who runs sign up. Um, I'm doing business with that race event. That's that's how we think about it. Advantage as far as it's a one-to-many, so. One software provider that provides you know their solution to many merchants, if you will. Well, then, then that raises another question, and it may just have misunderstood. Are there some folks in this space that use you said a merchant of record model rather than an individual mid model? Thousands. Thousands. And they're mostly not in every case, but in many cases they're just play, breaking the rules. And they don't mean to be. They're not trying to break the rules. They just don't, don't know about them, or they've been doing it that way for years. And one of these days, Vandiv or one of the other processors taps on the shoulder and says, hey, we were sort of doing an audit, and we found or the card brand called us and said, you need to be a payment facilitator. And then you know, one of us consultants gets a call, and they scramble around and fix it. So, so if they are <coughs> offering services, some merchant type services, and they're taking the responsibility of merchant record, they are not really a payment facilitator because they're violating the rules. And that would require them to give an individual merchant ID to be a payment facilitator? More often they would convert to a PF, but they, they, they're handling the money from our case. So this is a problem. This is actually something you guys need to talk about. Yeah, it, it's actually a, a, a problem that we see in our industry. And something that we use quite honestly as a, a competitive selling advantage is that as a payment facilitator, we can sit down with a customer and say, we will not handle your race proceeds. It sits in escrow at Vantive. We give instructions on how it's paid out but it is not going through our operating account. We can't mix it in and pay it out with salaries and bonuses and rent and everything else. And, um, and that has happened in, in this industry and others where um, those proceeds that really belong to your customers get mixed into operating funds. And for better or for worse, um, you know, that business has some type of an issue. They need to dip into the, that money and then all of a sudden you have a spiral that the company can't recover from. So we use that um, effectively as a selling strategy that uh, we're not going to handle our customers' money. That's not our preferred way of doing business, and um, and that's enabled by the payment facilitator model. So, so just to clarify, then, if somebody is doing, as you called it, a master merchant model, that's not really following the payment facilitator rules. It may be, and it may not be. In the case she brought up, it's not following the rules. But in the case where it's Uber. Um, you're not, the thing to always look at if you're in doubt, you can get super, super complicated on this, or you can be super simple. So that's if, you're in, if you're in doubt, <laughs> look at who does the person think they're buying from. If they think, if in an Uber's case, I'm buying from Uber. If I have a problem, I call Uber. Uber's going to give me the refund, not Sam Jones who drove me. So that's a marketplace model. Clear cut, all the brands will agree with it. Simple. It gets a little more complicated when you start to get to an Etsy which I would argue an Etsy looks a lot more, if you're familiar with Etsy, I would argue Etsy is a payment facilitator because you have to call the craftsperson to get your refund. 
And if you have to call the sub, what we call the sub merchant, it's really not a marketplace. And a lot of the brands are starting to call that instead of merchant record, they're starting to call it marketplace. And if, if you have to deal with the sub merchant, you're a payment facilitator, not a marketplace. So that would say in Square, Square is clearly a payment facilitator. That was clearly. an example you gave. What is Uber then? If Uber Uber is a marketplace. Because Uber is a marketplace. Uber how, Uber how, how are they seen in the eyes of the network? <coughs> Marketplace. The marketplace. Okay. So is that if I looked up in that seven hundred pages of really simple but easy to read rules that Visa and Mastercard have? Thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. Okay. I knew it was big. Would I find a definition for a marketplace? In Visa's case, yes. I don't believe I've seen a specific one in the case of the others. Okay. In other words, the complexity. Uh, well, I think well, what we've seen is that they do fall in line with the same general principles. Yeah. Any questions so far? There's a question back here. I know there would be. So shout, and I'll repeat it if we need to. The question is, uh, you know, go back a little bit when we were talking about the prefixing. Um, so we know Stripe is a facilitator. Okay. It's, it's entirely possible. The question, if you couldn't hear it, was about whether the prefix, if, if, the, if, the plot, if it went through Stripe, but the prefix wasn't Stripe, it was a platform, a software, ISV platform, uh, it could be outside the rules, or they could have registered that platform, and they could have done a, con if they haven't registered the platform, it shouldn't be the name, and they probably would get caught. So, so one other geeky question, please. Yeah, I think what Todd's alluding to is a pay, you know, <coughs> PayFact can't register another sub PayFact underneath them, right? To acquire, you know, uh, um, sets up a PayFact. So Stripe is a payment facilitator. They, of course, work with many ISVs in a white labeled fashion. Um, however, Stripe, because they're a payment facilitator, cannot then register sub PayFacts underneath them. They could, however, if they were also registered as an ISO, they could register a payment facilitator under their ISO account. And as NISA, they can register the payment facilitator and then, but you would see that on the list or, or eventually they would make it to the list. So you actually, there's actually a process. You have to fill out forms or your acquirer fills out forms to register you as a payment facilitator. Alex in the front. So I feel bad for Joe, so I'm going to ask Joe a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to get done. I'm, I'm learning all this with you guys. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, but this is the perfect timing of it. Because what's going on here is, you know, is typical in payments is how complex this thing is, right? All the rules, regulations. Should be registered, shouldn't be registered, all that, right? And the common challenge and issue that you know, we find talking to ISVs is, you know, why the F should an ISV go through all this, you know, brain damage? And become Acronym F. F. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still from New York, right? So, you know, is it when and is it worth it? Because you know, clearly, you know, we hear it all the time. I'm a software company. I'm not a famous company. So, you know, how do you wrap your head around that? It, it's a great question, and um, you know, uh, I, I think it's one that lots of Lots of eyes, lots of software business struggle with. You know, um, I, I would even take a step back and say that most software businesses that, that we speak with, uh, you know, just think of this vague notion of payments as in, you know, I'm, I'm touching them every day. Uh, I'm, I'm helping sort of trigger a bill for my customers, but you know, I don't really make money off of it. Um, you know, it's, I'm using a third party right now. Um, you know, what do I do? And and uh, that's one of the questions is, you know, one is this right for me, um, and uh, you know, and, and two, if it is, how do I go do it? And you know, our our view is, you know, if you know, if, if you're a small two million dollar revenue business and you have ten million you know, ten million dollars of you know, or five million dollars of payment volumes, um, then you know, it, it probably makes sense, you know, as part of a, a bigger company. And, and we're seeing probably like. You know, one of the biggest trends that this model is driving in the software world is consolidation. And I think this, this model makes a lot of sense at scale, um, but for small businesses, um, you know, it doesn't. And, you know, we're, we're seeing folks like, and a lot of you have probably heard of these, you know, headline names, but folks like Ministry Brand out there and Blue Star Sports, 
Um, you know, events.com is one. Uh, you know that uh, it's it's the we know them. yeah we just, the, well I should be I know this is recorded for the evil empire so, uh, but uh, you know there's there's you know lots of businesses who are kind of making this making it possible for smaller software businesses to sort of participate in this model through sort of bringing them under the same ownership group bringing them under one sort of consolidated payments platform and uh, and and sort of allowing them sort of giving them the scale to take advantage of this and. Um, you know, I, I think it's like it, it's, it's very early in that process. You know, there's you all know thousands of small software businesses out there that are you know if they aren't today, they're going to soon be asking themselves sort of you know how do I play this payments opportunity? And um, you know, I think it's either they kind of grow to a size where it makes a lot of sense for them. I'm curious what, what your views are you know around sort of what that size threshold is, you know, or it's they're going to be part of this sort of massive software consolidation that's being. That has this, this sort of payments underpinning. Yeah, I, I, I'll take. It's not really a counterpoint. A little bit of a counterpoint. Just that. Yes, there is a size at which it's too small. It's just simple economics. If you're only throwing off fifty thousand dollars a year, you don't have money to pay for an employee. On the other hand, um, our smaller customers have one person dedicated to their payments business. If you can afford a person, or even maybe in some cases a half a person. Um, focused every day on underwriting merchants or monitoring the SCP, using automated tools. Um, and those businesses, you know, we saw them where they started from their first dollar um, and they start growing and they didn't hire their second person until they were at 180 million in volume per year. Uh, that was when they hired their second person dedicated to payments. So uh, it's not to be, that was a low risk business. They knew their customers. They were in a particular vertical. So there's a lot of factors, but if you n nail down those factors, you're not doing risky stuff, it's not, it's not as brain damage as it might seem. But you have to be at 10, 20, 30 million to even start thinking. Yeah, so, so, so here's a question when you say risky stuff. I just want to get back to the risk part. Kevin, you mentioned the seven or so questions you ask and then the ancillary questions, you have somebody doing underwriting. Well, you've got someone like a Stripe or a Square where they don't ask me anything except for maybe my name and my, you know, whatever, whatever my, my legal name is. When I signed up for NIPE, it took 90 seconds and they asked no questions. So is that because the magnitude of my volume was so small it just got rolled up with other things or what? Uh, yeah, um, I, I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said we're not profit. <laughs> Actually, when, when we built our um, questions for um, our sign up for people to get a payment account with us, we actually modeled it off of one of the folks that you just mentioned. So we, we've seen how they work, and um, they, they do ask, um, at least the one, of the, one of the ones that you mentioned, they do ask a progressive set of questions based upon how much processing volume you do. And, and it, it, it is a little bit more than just your name. Um, I remember it as being really fast, very yeah. fast. Yeah, they, they ask for your um, your name and address typically in the beginning. Uh, a tax ID number comes up pretty quickly in that conversation. Yep. Another entity that might receive the payment starts to come up pretty quickly in that uh, type of conversation as well. But um, our set of questions is modeled after that. We, we really prefer to get to the end set of information first because it's very difficult in our industry when you're dealing with volunteers and part-time timers and part-time race directors uh, to chase people down for tax ID numbers six months from when they took their first transaction. So we try to get as much information as we can up front uh, to be able to fully underwrite them, um, to be able to issue them a 1099K and everything else that we need to do with them at the end of the year. But um, your, 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 your point is, is well taken that folks are definitely working towards um, a, a seamless underwriting process as, as much as possible. Yeah, I'll just go back to Todd's comments on kind of the ease of getting set up as a payback. Um, what we've seen at Vantiv is, is kind of two things. Number one is um, the emergence of payment consultants that go in and work with our ISVs on developing policies and procedures around risk and underwriting, and educating them not only on how to pass the test right and, and work with Vantiv, but how to implement that, right? And then secondly, as Todd alluded to as well, we have uh, quite a few payment gateways that have coded on top of our platform that enable ISVs to get up and running much more quickly. So um, Todd has Infinicept, as you mentioned, our friends from Payrix are in the back of the room, where they provide a platform to these ISVs that give uh, folks prepackaged tools. So, you know, boarding APIs or 
Um, customer reporting APIs is an example. So these ISVs don't have to build out everything themselves. So they can leverage a third-party gateway if they'd like. Um, Let, let's take an example of somebody who's a merchant under under a payment facility, you know, or a payment facility, excuse me, uh, an ISV, and just give me an example of what working, what they do. I mean, I, I think in the description of this event, I said if you if you uh, do your books with QuickBooks, you can turn on payment acceptance in a heartbeat. And I, I don't know if they're actually do the, uh, I don't know, I, I'm assuming they're a payment facility. They are, they are. So give me another example and tell me what uh, a payments model or a model from someone else would simplify. And then why, why that ISP would say, okay, I want to be a facilitator. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so the first thing you got to do is you got to figure out how do you take those 10 or 15 questions that made it feel really easy for the, um, for the merchant signing up and turn that into a whole bunch of data. You know, getting to know your customer data, talking to um, LexisNexis or Ideology or ID Analytics or all of these companies that do know your customer and, and something that's auditable if you get, if you get called out by Vantive or by the card reps. It does a score. You, you might want to do a score so you can auto approve because um, that little, sorry, but your little nine pay account is not going to be worth spending a whole bunch of time to do manual underwriting. No, I understand. So, but you, do, so you do a simple score and then you get an auto approval and you get, uh, you get the, it, then the merchant ID created advantage and you turn them on. That's one whole workflow that there are companies like, uh, like we're mentioning in the company we started that create that. The second thing is, is going to give you a, a beautiful set of APIs for you to go run your business, but they're not going to give you a report, a reporting system that says, that says your logo on it and shows the merchant their data every day, deposits the money. They'll, they'll function the deposit. They'll send the money to the merchant for you, but you've got to tell them how much to send. You've got to tell them uh, if you're going to divert funds while we're waiting for the race to happen, you've got to tell them that we're diverting these funds for a while until we can fund them. Uh, so there are systems that do that. When there's a chargeback, nobody wants one, but they happen. If there's a dispute and a chargeback, someone has to notify the sub the sub merchant that there was a chargeback. Sub merchant, you know, the tools, the modern tools are doing that all electronically. There's an email that goes out. You got 50 bucks in your account today, and oh by the way, there's a chargeback. Check here. Here's some helpful tips. Click a button, upload a copy of the receipt or an invoice, and then you're defending the chargeback. And, uh, and so these tools help with those things and other back office. If you get a phone call, you will need to answer a question for the customer. You want to have a, a portal to see all the data rather than a, a flat file that's going to have thousands of merchants on the same file. So can you talk a little bit? Questions? Could we just go up a little bit yeah, on the conversation? And I'm going to point it to Joe on this. Can you just sort of, you know, at a high level, talk a little bit about the landscape here of the payments industry as far as we had just a lot of new entrants, a lot of disruption going on in the last three to five years. How is that shaking out today? And what sort of hits or opportunities are you seeing happening <coughs> with more consolidation as it relates to Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and then all the banks? Uh, just a little bit about that if you could. Because we've talked a lot about the mechanics here. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of go up like, a little like, bit. If you why are mind. you interested in that? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and uh, I'll, I'll answer your question from a slightly different angle, which is, you know, we're thinking of the new entrants to the space as being really software businesses. There certainly has been a lot of consolidation <coughs> in this world. And, and I think you guys might be better versed to speak about sort of the, the you know, the, the impact from a lot of the consolidation there. Um, to answer the question of what interests us about, you know, sort of this model, this space, is um, the idea that, and, and, and you put your finger on it, Todd, which is um, software businesses that are, you know, in certain verticals that are kind of sitting on top of these payments you know, are, are probably in the best position to to be the aggregator, to underwrite the payments. Um, and and uh, it's because, for, for the reason that you both spoke about, it's because that they, they have all this great data. And they know how to, they, they, they just, they're in a better position to manage risk. You know, it's the same way if, you know, if you're a bank and you're underwriting a loan, you know, you, you want to be able to have sort of the best book possible of data on, on that resident, on that, that home buyer. And, um, and so in this model, it's, it's 
that the software businesses, they have sort of the general ledger on these businesses, they know the accounting, they know the nature of the business. Um, and, uh, and, and so part of you is, is one, it makes sense to be housing software. Two, the, you know, there's, a, there's something just really attractive about a payments model where you're going in through the stickiest relationship possible. Um, See, that, that gets to something interesting because merchants don't care about payment, they just want it to work. Mm -hmm. So software businesses, you know, uh, you know, run and sign up is sort of like the heart of um, what what the events, what the the races they manage um, live off of. That's that's sort of top dog vendor. And um, if you're looking to, to sort of be a part of the payment story for those those you know, those events for those customers, it makes the most sense to to, to go in through sort of the most the mission critical relationship. It basically means if you're processing those payments as a payback, you have the stickiest bridge possible to, 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 to process those payments. You know, it's, it's very hard to be just sort of a merchant acquirer. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great model, but it is a little bit tough to sort of manage the, the margin compression, the churn, sort of finding a way to differentiate uh, amongst your peers. Um, but if you're, if you're a software business and you're the bridge in and you have this pitch to the customer of, this is going to be integrated. It's one less vendor. It's seamless, and you yourself are in a position to actually do that because you have all the data. It makes a ton of sense. So, from a value standpoint, sort of software and payments together, you know, we think that makes a lot of sense because it protects those payment flows. I just want to add one thing to what he said to tie it back to the brands. Go ahead. When you, she asked about the brands, and then I, you asked, how does this affect Visa, Mastercard, and American Express Discover? Mastercard said to Wall Street last year that they're going to double their network in five years, meaning 40 million extra merchants. Banks can't do it. They can't bring on the merchants. They're too, it's too expensive. It costs. It takes too long. It's too clunky. They need software providers who can do it much faster. They can sell through the internet. They can serve a vertical market. They're essential. That's the big picture. The time back. So, question for Jake, even though Joe was saying, okay, if this is the most sticky relationship, right? It's so to advantage, it's the most advantage to have as many ISVs through as many verticals as possible, right? What what does uh, Vantive provide above and beyond other processors that would want to attract these ISVs that the Vantive? How do you differentiate to make to make yeah, that happen? Yeah, that's our pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So. How is Vanna different? We built the model in 2011 uh, with the car brands. We have over 80% of all registered paybacks today, so we feel like we uh, we know the model better than anybody else. Um, you know, you guys can answer it well because you see the other processors. But uh, from our standpoint, a couple of things. One is our funding solution. We have an instruction-based funding. Uh, solution called Dynamic Payout that allows our software uh, providers to basically have control over all their sub merchants' funds without actually ever touching the transactions, which keeps the software developers out of the scope of being a money transmitter, which is quite expensive and very time consuming. Um, so they've got the ability to, uh, again, direct all funds without actually touching them from us. Um, of course, we build a, a team around each one of our, our partnerships. So while the model is based more on a wholesale relationship where Paybacks are buying transactions from us. It's not a revenue sh uh, revenue share type relationship, and um, hoping that Phantom is able to price that merchant appropriately. Um, instead, they're buying transactions from us. It's more profitable, uh, you know. Uh, well, there, there's a question I had: is if someone is buying transactions from you and then building them into payback model, you're probably not making per transaction what you would make if you sold those individual merchants because they're buying in bulk. So, That's right. what's in it for you? Um, well, we've got, it's a great question, right? Margin. Something that, uh, well, we're talking margin compression, and that, that clearly we've got someone buying it. masses of it, so where do you benefit? Yeah, so first of all, I think it's an important call out that we still, um, for a lot of <coughs> ISVs in a traditional model, right? So while payback is growing at a very fast pace on our team, so is our ISV business, right? So it's, it is determining um, where that software vendor is in their life cycle and if payback makes sense to them. Um, but secondly, your more direct question of, you know, what's in it for Vanov. Um, while the margin is less per merchant, um, our expenses are greatly reduced as well. So you think about the traditional model. 
you have bandit pays five or six sales people to set up that merchant, right? A business development person that brings on the ISV, their partner manager, a sales executive, um, somebody to board that merchant. If a merchant calls us, it's 12 to 15 bucks every time we pick up the phone. And then in four to six months, our retention department oftentimes gets involved. So you're paying six or seven folks internally every time that we touch that merchant. Um, the beauty in the payback model is it, it is they're buying transactions, right? So it's a it's an environment where that software provider is, is controlling the pricing, the boarding, et cetera. Our costs are much, much you know, less in the so, model. Let me ask very specific. What's the attrition on a merchant that's boarded directly? I, mean, I, I don't want you to give away trade secrets. I know for some ISOs it's twenty five percent. I mean how much less is the attrition when someone through a payback versus someone for it? Well, I think that's our, our two biggest selling points with payback, right? Is number one, in processing <coughs> revenue. You're able to control the revenue associated with each merchant. So this is the selling point to the ISV. Yeah. So as run sign up setting up their merchant, they're able to price that merchant appropriately, right? In a referral model, you're hoping that the processor is able to price that merchant the right way and based on your buy rate that you're making something after that, right? Um, and then second is customer retention. Their run signups controlling the entire experience for that person. So while we provide run signup with support, right, you know, level two support, if they've got questions and, and issues, um, we are in the background. The submerchant has no idea that we even exist. So sure. the retention is much, much higher because the ISV is able to control their merchant's experience. And I think when we talk to ISVs about why be a payback, um, it's, it, it comes down to experience at the end of the day, right? Defining experience. We've had ISVs that say our net promoter score gets brought down when we have that handoff to a processor, right? So, so just to make sure. So, in other words, when the ISV comes to you and says, "Hi, I'm selling you this software. Now you can get processing. Why don't you process it with Vantage?" That's a clunkier, less satisfying in some cases. Yeah, and so from an ISV perspective, they want to make sure that they're signing up the most amount of merchants within their integrated payments platform, right? And I call it the leaky bucket effect within the integrated payments in that that handoff occurs, fan of calls the merchants, they're negotiating rates and fees, merchant gets confused on it, and we end up losing them to you know, Square or a merchant level salesperson. Nobody wins in that environment, right? We're not winning, the ISV's not winning, et cetera. So in that environment, the, you know, instead of, you know, I think our best <coughs> scenario relationships are 50 to 60% lead to sign up in our integrated payments model. Um, where payback, I mean, as you're signing up for the software, you're also signing up for payments. It's part of the experience. So, okay, so I have a, I have, take a question. Time. So you used to be involved in integrated payments, yeah. right? I, if you take it typical, I'm going to make up a, a, an ISV. They, they sell pest control software. Well, well, tell us what integrated payments is versus the payment. Uh, integrated payments is like he was talking about with the referral. You touch the referral over the wall. A salesperson calls the, calls the software co company's customer, the merchant, and tries to sell them payments. So they deal with two salespeople, the guy who sold them the software, and somebody else who tries to yeah, sell them the handoff. Yeah. And so I'm going to make up a fake ISV. It's a pest control software. They They help, uh, they, they manage local pest control companies running around and, and, uh, and, and uh, exterminating pests, right? And so they have a thousand, the pest control software has a thousand merchants. Yep. How many of those merchants, once they, they're fully up and running, how many of those merchants would the software company's partner typically have out of a thousand? The software company's partner. They acquire. How many would they have sold up in the integrated? I think 50% is the best case scenario. In the integrated scenarios. So, so one of the arguments for Vantive is not just growth and not just low cost, but they're going to get more total market because in the payback model, it's going to be 100%. Because if you take the software, you have the profits. Uh, this man is breaking his arm, and he's a sponsor. <laughs> Let me make a comment about the previous question. I think it was a good one in terms of industry perspective. So. Um, these trends, so if you look at some of the acquisitions, you know, why did Vantage buy WorldPay? If you look at why Pieces bought Cayenne and other companies, because payment processing is, is a commodity. It's utilities. So it's like electricity. Yeah. You can't turn on your business without it anymore. But, you know, what integrated payments means, you're seeing companies get bought, whether it's they're buying, you know, first data is buying point of sale companies. So they're going to merge and say, we're not selling you credit card processing. We're selling you this Clover device that's <laughs> going to run your business for you, right? It's the same thing that 
you know, that, that Kevin is saying. So the payment companies are buying technology that adds value through software so that they can be you know, more than commoditized companies. So all these transactions you're seeing, including the WorldPay one, because um, that's what Vantage, you know, speciality is, this integrated payments from the Mercury company. So <coughs> that's driving a lot of the, the strategy and, and consolidation in the payment business. And that's the domestic processing. Yeah, yeah we, we've even seen that in our industry as well. Um, a large competitor of ours, Active Network, was purchased recently by Global Payments. So a highly specialized vertical yeah. integrated software vendor in the registration space was bought by a traditional credit card payments processing company. So the payments processing companies are really going after those additional margins that are provided by that value add software that comes along with it. So, so by buying that, are they buying a source of leads effectively? Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're buying the credit card processing at a higher margin than they can do on their own. And, and, and through a stickier relationship as yeah. well. So it's, it's much more protected. And that's, and that's driving down through to sort of smaller software businesses as well. There's this, again, to this idea of sort of consolidation. Um, there's this whole idea that if you can build enough scale, uh, then you know, the payment processors as a backstop are gonna wanna acquire you at some point. You know, I, I, we sort of think about it as this trend toward you know, payment processors sort of having um, the challenge of, of not you know, being able to offer a totally differentiated solution, just standalone, um, but through partnership or through acquisition, um, they can really fortify their payments relationships. And it's, it sort of feels like a race to see that like, who, can, who can sort of you know, acquire or partner with in a, in a, in a very meaningful way um, software. And I would even say like tech-enabled services businesses, really just any vendor who has a close relationship with the end customer and that touches payments and can be an avenue in that, that sort of protects them. And um, you know, I, I think, you know, again, sort of I've, I've made the comment, I, you know, I think we all think it's probably very early in that story of sort of the processors of scale at the top um, trying to find their way to payment flows, to credit card flows, um, through sort of a very fragmented software world right now that's really coming together because the payment processors are looking for ways to sort of, you know, pick up these, these flows at scale that, um, that again, sound redundant, but, but are sort of fortified and protected through really, these really meaningful vendor relationships. We're in the uh, top of the second inning. Um, Cayenne getting acquired by Jesus Signal at the end of the first inning. Uh, that's over. We're in the top of the second. What's going to happen next is all these smaller companies that are not so much on the radar, they're going to start growing payments volume. Some of them will start combining. Um, we're predicting that there'll be half a trillion dollars in payment, gross payment volume in 2021, representing about 4.4 billion in net revenue uh, from the payment facilities, from the ISPs. Now, now, is that going to be, is that going to be incremental volume that wasn't processing payments before? It's going to be shifted over for other yeah. some processing of, Some of those. Because the square one was famous because they got, you know, like a guy like, like us to process payments, that's a couple bucks. But all their efforts going into get, to getting the traditional businesses now, over 125,000 in annual volume. So, so there's my, one of my questions too. We've talked about it from the, the processor's perspective, from the acquirer's perspective. We've talked about it a little bit from why a software, why an ISV would want to be a payback. With Kevin, I can see, because you don't run a race all, you know, you run a race, you want to have it all in a package at once. Accounting software, like the Quicken example, I can, I, I don't use the processing, but it's there if I need it. What about from the merchant's perspective? What's the benefit? Say I'm processing a traditional relationship, so ISO called me up, and then the guy who runs my software says, hey, you know, take this new software and it's got payments there. What's the benefit for the end merchant? So uh, I think one of the, the big benefits is, you know, through your trusted software <coughs> provider, you now have them sort of interacting with the customer. And um, it, you know, it, just, it just brings you closer to ownership of the whole customer experience through you know, one, one vendor and it's more seamless, I would say. Yeah, as a, as a small business, I have a consulting firm and it's a pain in the ass when I have to, when I have to get a contract and get in it a stupid NDA. And then you have to get the, send across a proposal. And then you go and you get signatures on the proposal. And then when it's time to start delivering it, you just <coughs> send them documents. If I had a software, there are some of these. There was software that just managed all that for me. I just press a button, the proposal gets updated. And then at the end, I get paid. I would pay a lot of money. For, 
I really would pay a lot of money for that because I won't be able to hire someone. So the decision is not about payments, it's about the software and then they're adding payments. Yeah. Well, and what, a, what a lot of vendors are doing today is if you want to use a third party processor, they charge a fee. Sure. So in other words, like if I ha I'm an ISO and I want to go and, and to a restaurant and they're using certain software, it costs me money to put up the chain. Do they even let it at all? Oh, yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's hard. Toast, I think Toast doesn't even, if you want Toast, you have to take Toast's uh, uh, process. Right. And they, and they pre-price it at a certain point, even though I might be cheaper, but then all of a sudden when they start charging, you know, then this, it's going to cost you 500 or 1,000 per POS system. It's not worth it for the year. Uh, because that restaurant will go out of business with their, <coughs> their, soft, their software. They could just go down the street to the next guy without their payments. That's correct. Yeah, and I think from a merchant's perspective, um, it eliminates the number of people they have to deal with at the end of the day. So, like, traditionally, a point of sale software provider, you have to be integrating to a gateway technology right. that's sold by an ISO with a processor behind it, right? So, if a processing problem happens, is it a gateway issue? Is it the processor issue? Is it the software issue? Should I call my bar, right, to help try to figure it out? Right, there's four hands in that transaction, right? So in the payback model, there's one hand, right? The, the people that are providing the software are also your payments company behind it. So it eliminates much of the cost and complexity for a merchant when they're buying their software. What about the data analytics and the customer insights if you own that information? How is that shared back to the actual company? Sure. So um, we actually allow our race events to actually own their own data. And um, <coughs> uh, we actually have built a fair amount of analytics. We call it um, race analytics that uh, they can get on their dashboard. They can see graphs of their registrants. We can tell them um, where their marketing dollars were spent and where the registrants came from and match that up to where they spent the marketing dollars. And um, they own the list of registrants for their races that they can market to in the future for other races that they have. So um, that's kind of all enabled as part of our software and enabled as part of our race agreement with those submergents of those races that they can own that data and they uh, can use it for their marketing and analytics purposes. We see that as stage three, so it's Stage one is just getting a hold of the payments revenue. Stage two is optimizing and creating an opportunity for growth. And stage three is data analytics and, and really building <laughs> the gentleman here and then here and then you get that. You already got two. So. <laughs> a quick question. You alluded to it a little bit before. I think it's maybe Jake would probably be the best one. You defer sort of like the, the risk management to the, to the, uh, the ISV, right? How, how do you the ISV, which is a payback. Right. So, so the question is, do you need, do you not ever need to know what all the submergents are to back, properly value the risk of a particular relationship, or some high, high We, we monitor to portfolios no? to make sure that um, that ISV that we <coughs> brought on and underwrite are, are boarding the business that they said they would. Um, so we we absolutely act with that, for, you know, monitor that portfolio uh, to ensure the the business is clean and. and and that's required by the card brands. Yeah, the Vantive does uh, OFAC and match check at the front end of our process, and uh, sometimes things will end up in manual review because there's either a match or there's a suspected match. So there is some front end underwriting uh, that Vantive does. It's, it's light, uh, and then we do the you know the balance of the underwriting with a KYC score. We use some other automated tools and social media and a whole bunch of other things to make sure that we're comfortable with the merchant. But there is a um, some front end piece that Vantive does. I think another observation too is, um, you know, I think a lot of the, the verticals, the software verticals where this model has taken root in the early days are ones where they're really quality payment flows. Um, you know, they, they tend to be lower risk oftentimes. These software businesses are serving sort of affinity organizations, um, just low chargeback, low fraud verticals. So I, I think it's early days in the story of sort of how, um, you know, how this risk model holds up. Um, you know, I, I think there will be some iteration. I think it will develop, um, but I don't know that it's been really sort of tested under sort of some of the the, hard, some of the more challenged payments verticals in terms of or software verticals um, in, from, a, from a risky payment point of perspective. There's there's some very 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 risky payment facilitators out there. We we shy away from them uh, as a business. We just don't play in those areas. But there are some very risky ones. There have been some big blow ups. Uh, this is part of been in uh, China and, and Africa, auditing companies that have 
uh, companies and banks that have blown up. So there, there are some things that have happened out there. In the U.S. market, I think the U.S. market has that buttoned up pretty well. Yeah. A lot of those guys go offshore to try and route transactions the wrong way. Well, I want to make sure the question gets addressed. Do you still have a question? Yeah. Okay. So, Kevin, uh, I'm an ISP as well. When you, when you launched into this, uh, how nervous were you that you were going to get tons of phone calls about chargebacks and all kinds of uh, problems? And did you push all those calls to the sub? Or do you guys take them on behalf of your clients? No, we actually handle chargebacks on behalf of our clients. And it's a very, very small percent and number of our business that actually occur as chargeback. Um, one of the reasons that we pick Bandit as a payment facilitator is that descriptor thing that we talked about earlier. The descriptor that we were able to get from Bandit is actually longer than what we could do with our other payment processor. So it actually helps prevent chargebacks because- so, so That's a geeky point but it's an important point. Yeah, because, because it, 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 that lessens the number of people who look at their billing items and say, what the heck was that? Okay. Yeah, so, that, so, so that, you didn't have, you didn't get blown up by a whole bunch of people calling you and you didn't have to staff up significantly, I mean. We, we had to do, we certainly had to do some prep work. We had to build policies and procedures and actually Todd's company helped us with that. Uh, but then we had to implement those policies and procedures. We actually had to put them into our, uh, some of that into our payment software flow uh, we hired a, uh, a full-time underwriter uh, that works for us, and, and he's uh, gotten so good at it that he now does half of his time on customer support and half of his time on <laughs> underwriting. So it actually has become less of, of a responsibility for us. We've automated that underwriting flow. We we um, audit, uh, we, we look at customers uh, based on the amount of buying that they do with us, and our software looks at that buying on a regular basis to figure out what we need to do. Uh, we put in automated tools to do KYC scoring. We also have an automated tool that looks at the uh, digital footprint of someone setting up a payment account with their physical footprint and set, sees if there's a match there. Uh, we use social media. We use um, the state registrations for businesses. We use a whole bunch of uh, additional tools. But yeah, there's there's some additional work that's done. Uh, but the payoff for that, uh, this is kind of something that no one's really mentioned yet, so I'll go out ahead and say it. Man, that was cheaper than everybody else. <laughs> At least that for us they were, and so um, we paid some money to put policies and procedures in place, and um, and then implement that, put a person in place. But that relationship, uh, as us as a payment facilitator, it's got a bunch of advantages for our business, but it's also we think closer to the back end iron of the processors, and because of that, we pay less for it than we would with someone who's doing more of that work for us. And, and just we had a question for Mr. Malay. Oh, yeah, Kevin, just a quick one for uh, Ron sign up. You're getting hit. It sounds like you have a lot of data and customer contact information by way of emails from your subs. Do you offer a bolt on API for customer management to them, like a CRM system or something like that, too? Um, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> it seems like it would be a natural progression out of the uh, yeah. data that you have. Yeah, you absolutely. Have. We, we um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we, we do help yeah. customers. With yeah, we're talking to the microphone. Anyway. Oh, sorry. We do help customers a lot with the marketing for their events and um, email marketing, referral marketing, um, where they spend their marketing dollars to track that and then track their registrations that go against that. So we have some really for our size companies some pretty sophisticated analytic tools. But yeah, um, a CRM or customer relationship management is an extension that we do see uh, coming for our software. I do think it, I'd be remiss if I didn't add that some of the stuff that Kevin and his team built um, that didn't exist when you first were getting started, there weren't a lot of tools like that. There are companies, not just mine, but there are a number of companies that have built tools that make some of those things out of the box so that you can get those seven, eight, nine, ten different underwriting checks or risk checks um, out of a sort of solution in the box. So simplicity seems to be one piece of it for the end merchant because it simplifies their life. And, and, and nobody disagreed with me when I said it, and so I'll say it again, merchants don't care about payments. One thing I, people who know me hear me say all the time, all but the top 30 merchants or so don't have anybody who thinks about payments more than maybe once a quarter, maybe once a month. So they don't care. So simplicity is one point, makes their life easier. What about the pricing side? If you look at a current merchant statement acquired the normal way, typically your eyes will be trying to figure out how much it costs you. How does a, a, a payment facilitator typically price processing? So I'll, I'll go first on that. Um, our, Maybe no tip. <laughs> our processing uh, fees are really flat. Uh, they're the same for any race that comes to us. 
Um, and you can see them on our website. We're transparent about how that works. It's about 6% of the cost of a race is the processing fee uh, on our system. Um, where, we, uh, where we offer volume uh, discounts is by way of a partner program that we have. So if a race brings a certain number of registrations to us or a certain volume of processing to us, they can qualify for our partner program and they get a rebate of their processing fee as part of that. And now, was that 6% for the whole package? Not 6%. I mean, because those of us who are payment guys and who profit them say, wow, 600 basis points, that's a lot. But is that for everything you provide in addition to processing? Yeah, so um, everything we provide is actually free. So all the stuff I mentioned, um, that, that website and that email marketing and, and um, you know, getting text of your results, all of our software is basically free. And the way that we monetize that relationship is by way of processing. And um, six percent, as I mentioned, that's that's roughly what our fee is. And some of the lower dollar volumes, we have fixed dollars because of some of the credit card fees, fixed fees that you have on smaller type transactions. But it's six percent of the transaction, and we also pay uh, interchange out of that. So the sub merchant doesn't deal with interchange; they basically just deal with our fee, uh, which we um, hope to be you know, very transparent up front, so folks know what they're going to pay. And, and I think, you know, speaking about benefits of, of the model, uh, you know, and simplicity, um, you know, one benefit to to both the ISV as well as their customers is by combining, you know, the software offering, other services, and the and the, the payment processing piece, um, you're able to kind of offer a very simplified sort of pricing model, and often one that's that's discounted to market because you have just more economics to work with. There's sort of a, a, a value that passes through the customer, you know, in addition to just sort of the, the better experience. You know, I, I think probably the biggest reason to do it is because of a better customer experience, but it does sort of give you a differentiated pitch to, to your end customers, whether they're, they're events or organizations or nonprofits, um, you know, around a simplified pricing model and one that's, that's pretty darn competitive if you stack it against sort of, you know, uh, a standalone software business plus a, a, a standalone payments business. Joe, how would you value the revenue the, the revenue of a payment facilitator revenue stream versus an ISO or an agent? The revenue of a payment facilitator, I think, increasingly is is sort of comparable to the, the, the revenue multiples you see of a, of a, of a SaaS business. Um, it's very high quality, you know, recurring revenue you know, even if it's not sort of subscription revenue, which you know, for those of you in the software world where that's sort of the, the, the holy grail, you have amazing revenue visibility, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty darn close because you have, you know, this great data record of sort of recurring transactions or, or reoccurring transactional revenue um, that, uh, that, that's very integrated. And, and unlike ISOs, again, it keeps coming back to this idea of like, it's very sticky. If you look at sort of retention rates of these types of businesses, um, it, it's very high. It's 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 high in the way that, that SaaS or subscription revenue is. So, um, so it's, it it makes for you know a very valuable model having these two together. So, important. so I, I can comment on, yeah, please. on the revenue piece. Um, and again, another important call out is you know the payment processing revenue is is that ISV. They own that revenue stream. Um, that merchant's not entering into terms and conditions with Vantive, right, where we own that merchant. Um, you know, so as a software developer is, you know, looking at monetizing uh, their payments, but maybe also taking on um, outside investments, you know, owning that revenue stream associated with payments is a, a huge piece of that. So thinking about where we mentioned Toast, I mean, Toast is a uh, software platform for restaurant, right? It's restaurant oriented. And so you get Toast. I guess Toast, I know it a little bit. It has, uh, it essentially allows you to manage the whole table flow and tabling and where people are seating and probably your inventory. And the processing is built into it. Kevin's got events. You say, I'm going to do a race. I want to get this set up. That's not a one off, but I might do three or four or five races a year. What are some other models yeah. that software bias these that, because those are kind of, I wouldn't say obvious, but they kind of make sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for, for example, do you see bigger restaurant chains going for an ISV model? Or tell me, where, where, where do you well, see it going? Yeah, I mean, you asked this question earlier and we didn't answer it. I did? Uh, and, uh, you asked uh, uh -huh. what, what type of you know, paybacks do we have, right? And traditionally, paybacks were hard not present in low risk verticals, right? So, <coughs> sign ups or education or healthcare or utility payments. What we see now is the emergence of more and more hard present kind of point of sale software providers. 
that want to be payment facilitators, of course, for the, re the revenue and the retention, uh, but also the experience that they're providing their clients, right? I, I spoke about, you know, an ISV who said, hey, our net promoter score gets beat up by a, an external payment processor. They call the processor. If there's an issue, there's a lot of finger pointing that happens. And in the payback model, they're, they're able to solve that. Todd said, we're in the beginning of the second inning right now, right, for, for paybacks and, and the volume that's, that's growing. I think what we're going to see is many more companies like Toast that have a proprietary software that their merchants are, are buying, so they know they're legitimate businesses, sharing verticals that they feel like are lower risk and that if chargeback occurs, they can either handle it themselves or pass it to that sub-merchant. And they have the ability to monitor their portfolio so they know that these are legitimate businesses that aren't accumulating a ton of you know refunds and chargebacks associated with it. So I think you know from my perspective we're gonna see more and more verticals that are selling this you know uh, software to their to their in merchant getting the pay you know, getting the payback model because they want to provide a more complete solution to their clients. We're seeing a ton of healthcare uh, we're seeing a ton of business to business activity. They're, they're both of those there are paybacks in this room from both those verticals. Um, we're seeing I think we heard about um, events. Events are huge. Invoices are huge. We're seeing a ton of activity on just uh, horizontal invoicing. A ton of activity in emerging markets where um, you know and it, it, there are just very few, less than 100,000 terminals in all of Romania. You know, there's, and this is the, the least, second least terminalized country in, in Europe. So globally, there's a huge amount of terminalization happening through payback as well. So the, the verticals you mentioned, the where you see a lot of the growth, I don't see. Do you see? A, I don't see a shift from, like I said, like a grocery store, a department store right now, which I'm sure they have some guy who goes crazy trying to figure out what their cost of acceptance is. Simplicity might work for them, but do you see reasons that that could move to a payback model or wouldn't? So, so I mean, supermarkets and petroleum. You know, if they can get over their hatred of interchange. You know, uh, <laughs> They'll be maybe more open to it. I think if, if there was a if there was a software vendor that was willing to do it, I think they might get more attention and more interest than expected. Not from the very biggest. Shell's gonna you know fight over a, a tenth of a cent. Because right? of their business, they, they yeah. need it, right? And they do. Yeah, it's a little more business. Yeah, more business. Come on. Yeah, some of those larger merchants that are. Um, negotiating rates and getting down to the bare bones because they're a large supermarket. Payback may not make sense unless you hire a pricing expert, right, that uh, yeah. understands the cost that you're buying transactions well, what about Morton Williams, they have four stores in the area. They were the ones who came down to talk. <coughs> Would they, could you see a vendor say, hi, you know, your inventory management software, we're going to roll this into a two or something? We know payment facilitators processing a billion dollars with 20 some merchants, so. Yeah, there are there are very large merchants or very large entities, but that payment facilitator is adding enormous value uh, to those sellers. They pay it all day long. Uh, the, in those examples, I think one untapped. If there's entrepreneurs in the room, an untapped area is franchises. Franchises are a huge opportunity for payback. So you basically That's roll in and say, uh, "You franchise mine, and we'll take care of all the the, the payment acceptance, everything else." That that's in the pack. Should be just part of that. Uh, uh, we got a Rada and that's the question. So um, it sounds it sounds like there's an opportunity here for folks like Verifone and Ingenico and so on to become uh, payment facilitators for certain parts of their business or parts of the verticals that they sell to. Ingenico is one. I don't know if Verifone is anymore when they got rid of the taxi business. Okay. And follow one question to that. It also sounds like it, like there's an opportunity for some sort of uh, merger, if you will, some sort of roll up of the of the payment facilitators. Better have a lot of money. <laughs> e firms do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're seeing a ton of activity within e firms and our, our payment facilitators. I was going to give a counter example. The petroleum Exxon has an app. I, I'm sure they wrote it themselves, but. Um, it provides a lot of value because you can turn on the pump without getting out of your car and it has some other stuff like plenty points and everything and they're doing card not present race so they're kind of sacrificing mm -hmm. um, for interchange for the customer experience mm -hmm. so so sometimes they do take a more really holistic time. view yeah. yeah actually I was gonna build on that we just this week at the national we 
out there. And, you, know, you think of department stores, there's a lot of, in, in petroleum, there's a lot of legacy solutions there, but, but they're constantly getting disrupted, right? You have, you know, clerks walking around stores now with tablets, right? Um, you know, helping customers with inventory and, and doing purchases. Now, odds are a lot of those applications are driven by ISVs, right? And, and the more disruption you see, the more you're going to see payment <coughs> facilitation, you know, creep into those more legacy brick and mortar types of businesses. You think? <coughs> I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that's a trend that should start to reveal itself more over time. And, uh, and also to comment on the, on the, the what verticals, uh, I, I would sort of blanket it as, yeah, you know, there's, there's like hundreds of verticals where I think this makes sense. Um, and, and the draws and sort of common uh, themes of those verticals, I think, you know, and, and curious about B2B because we granted a small sampling, haven't seen as much there, but like think of it as really just any vertical where there's just sort of constant recurring credit card payments that happen. And um, oftentimes we associate that with consumer because I think, you know, in the B2B world, certainly, uh, you know, a generalization, but you know, you don't see as many sort of credit card payments occurring. You see it more sort of B2C, but you, know, you mentioned PEST before, uh, you know, there's, uh, I threw out plumbing, plumbing software earlier, anything sort of, any service related to sort of re residents or homes or, or renting items. Um, I think there's hundreds of, of verticals where sort of this model um, makes sense and, um, you know, will we'll probably take root in, in the near to intermediate future. Yeah, I think how weird would it be for a plumber to uh, negotiate their rates with a credit card processor, right? <laughs> what they're going to do is they're going to go to right. Square, right? Because right. it's passed the police resistance. So that's not good for the ISP because they're not monetizing the payment there, right? So that's an example of the beauty of, of Payback is they offer that full solution to the merchant with payments built into it. My plumber actually had been doing some work to do the pipe burst. Um, they actually have an iPad and they show me a picture of what they're about to do. It has the quote on it, and then I literally press a button to do it. It sends me a link to pay with my credit card, and they use a payment facility. So even the plumber is, is, has gone down that route. Um, and, and to talk about B2B, we can talk offline about it, but my largest customer pays me through a payment facility. I'm a sub-merchant of a payment facilitator in the room, under Vantive, paid by one of my largest, by my largest customer. And do you think like um, the, the sort of the, the nature of the payment flows, you know, sort of smaller payment, you know, I think there's sort of B2B, can, you can segment it, you know, in a lot of different ways. Certainly large ticket transactions. These are large. Make, these are large? Large, large, ticket. large yeah. ticket. Larger ticket than I knew they, they allowed. And um, think about this, the suppliers to very large businesses are not all large. Suppliers to very large businesses can be incredibly small, and every large business deals with a, sm a small business of some type. Question back here. Do you have a question or not? Uh, I did not have a question, but B2B is interesting. The, that's where we got started, B2B and pre-trading like everyday spending and tax payments for building, trade and service, bill payments. Um, it hasn't been penetrated as it should be, but there's one opportunity in that space. Just trim on that. But a lot of them are going now. Yeah. Question for Joe, where, where do you see the center of gravity as far as the consolidation that's happening? Is it more the payment processors or is it SMS players or the other kind of players? I, I think it's both. Uh, I think sort of the, the backstop is, is the processors. Um, yeah, I think over time you'll see them continue to do these acquisitions that, um, that, that, that just sort of, you know, ensure sort of longer lasting relationships with the end customers. Um, but there's there's sort of like an intermediary step of, um, you know, taking these really fragmented spaces and sort of building scale on them through consolidation. I think that will occur, um, you know, with, with software strategics, with, you know, our, uh, our peers in the space and you know, financial sponsors. Um, and I think as they sort of build scale through sort of doing the work for the processors, of bringing together a lot of these smaller businesses, uh, I think that's where the processors probably get interested. I'd argue we're entering a period of expansion, not consolidation, <clears throat> uh, because a lot of these software companies who can build a cheap, uh, really inexpensive with, with SaaS, they have cloud, 
they can build a software for some incredibly micro niche market that you wouldn't even have considered being a market you could go after in the past. They build the software, they add payments to it, they start growing it. That's what I, I believe that's tw the story of 2018, maybe 2019, is expansion, thousands, literally thousands of new um, software companies becoming payments companies, and then you'll see little roll-ups and bigger roll-ups. Yeah. It's the beginning of that effect. And there's definitely yeah. sort of an organic growth story here as well. I, I, I think it's both. I think it, they, they sort of complement each other. You know, you have and so. yeah, because the guys who just sold it go start another one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it's getting close dates. I think we're gonna um, wrap this. There's still some drink back there, but let's do this kind of sum up because we started talking. Todd just talked about. He said we're at the beginning of the second inning. I think he was taking us to the third inning. So where do we see it? Three, four years down the road with this pay pack model. Todd, you can kick it off. I or think we're going to see. Uh, there's demand feeds supply, so as there's this opportunity, <coughs> there are more providers, more sponsors uh, interested. It's opening new Sponsors being, being acquirers? Being acquirers. Um, you're seeing, this is really, this is quite big in the US, quite big in, in uh, Europe, quite big in India, but we haven't seen any kind of explosion yet in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia Pacific. There's a huge push by governments around the world for financial inclusion. There's a huge amount of activity getting more. I mean, I was in Egypt last month, and there were there are uh, 100 million people. Uh, there are uh, less than 20 percent of them have a bank account, and less than three percent of the consumer expenditures are electronic. And so this is just if, if invest in the card brands uh, that if, with your with your 401k, they're not going anywhere. And pay tax is going to expand the multiple, and I don't give investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else? Anybody else? Any prognosticate? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, I've been in integrated payments for 11 years, and I now only lead our payback team because of my belief in in the space and in the trends that this will continue to grow. Um, at the end of World Pay, excuse me, we, uh, <laughs> you know, we're really excited. They came into the room, they were bad, and they leave now we're World Pay. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, got that. Yeah, um, for us, it's really exciting that you know we acquired World Pay in uh, in that it takes our world class U.S. payment facilitator solution international, right? So we're very excited to uh, to learn more about the international markets and uh, take the tools and the uh, expertise that we have built here in, in the U.S. and, and go international with it. Any other comments or because uh, flavor? So. Yeah. yeah more and more plumbers and I think you'll just see it widespread and I, and I think more and more software businesses will be aware that this is an option they'll be aware of the benefits um, I, I think it's coming at them from a lot of different directions and I think you'll see sort of a correct you know I would say a ramping sort of adoption of this sort of model um, and, and I think it'll catch fire in certain verticals I think you know once one software provider does it and its competitors realize it'll sort of ramp and, and I guess I'll go last. The, uh, we do see some consolidation and, and additional adoption as well. Um, one of the, uh, the other roles I have is on the um, vice chairman of the payment facilitator committee for the PTA. And um, the, those uh, conferences, people will come up all the time and, and want to talk about our experience of becoming a payment facilitator. So I know there's a lot of interest in the model and a lot of companies that are considering that. Um, in, in terms of consolidation, um, I, I don't necessarily see an ISV uh, wanting to consolidate around payments. I think the value from our perspective is in the software. However, um, that's not necessarily the, the case for a more horizontal um, credit card processing company. They may want to consolidate around payments, and that's some of the activity that we've seen so far. So uh, we think continued growth and, and continued um, consolidation at some point in time as well. I want to thank everyone. I I just want to thank the panelists. This is great. I mean, I can agree with that. I hope you've enjoyed this is the sort of thing we like to do about once a month in Taipei. So, uh, mention the stream, too. Oh, yeah, by the way, this has all been recorded and it's on our YouTube uh, channel. So, you can stream live and you can go watch it. And, uh, and or it. there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah, there's a bunch of them out there. You can see, I think we've got probably six, yeah, probably 10 or 12 now. Yeah, and if you can't make it to the next event, you can watch it live yeah, on the live stream. Yeah, you can watch it live 
Um, there's still for some members there. We don't have to clear out of this place for a little while, so if you guys want to hang out and talk. And again, thank you very, very much for joining us, for sponsoring, and I hope you found this interesting and enjoyable. That's great.